Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. My name is Amanda Jabro. I'm a Portfolio Manager with TRICOM. As an Administrative and Financial Solutions Provider to the staffing and consulting industry, it is our philosophy to be an active member of the staffing industry by staying abreast of the ever-changing marketplace. For that reason, TRICOM was pleased to launch the Industry Insider webinar series designed to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. One of our core values is to build relationships and become a leading resource to staffing and consulting firms nationwide. Our presenters today are Michael Thompson and Joe Rotondo with Sterling Talent Solutions. Michael has been with Sterling Talent Solutions for four years. As a director of sales, Michael is here to help clients mitigate applicant and employee risk with fully compliant practices throughout a comprehensive suite of products and services. Michael has proven, proven to be an expert in the staffing industry during his time with Sterling, personally partnering with many of lo the local chapters of ASA as an expert in background screening and drug testing. Joe has been with Sterling Talent Solutions since August of 1978. He has filled many roles with the company through the years including Polygraph Examiner, Director of Operations, and is currently the Vice President of Compliance. Sterling Talent Solutions provides hiring peace of mind by delivering a simpler, smarter background screening and onboarding experience for employers nation, uh, worldwide. Their comprehensive suite of cloud-based background screening and onboarding solutions deliver accurate, reliable results and tools to maintain compliance throughout the hiring cycle. With 18 offices in eight countries, their team of more than 3,500 employees proudly serves over 50,000 customers around the world, including 25% of the Fortune 100. Sterling Talent Solutions is accredited by the National Association of Professional Background Screeners, a distinction earned by fewer than 10% of all background screening companies. Many staffing firms conduct background checks on prospective job applicants as part of the employment screening and hiring process. The use of this information obtained is governed by the Fair Credit Reporting Act. In today's edition of the Industry Insider Webinar, Sterling Talent Solutions will cover what employers need to know about compliance with topics including general information, procedures required by the FCRA, denying employment, and other legislation to consider. By the end of this session, you'll know the basics to Fair Credit Reporting Act compliance. If you have any questions during the presentation, please utilize the Q&A feature located on the right toolbar. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. Please join me in welcoming Michael and Joe. Great. Thanks so much, Amanda. We appreciate the introduction. Uh, hello to everybody that's on the call. Uh, again, my name is Mike Thompson. We have Joe Rotundo on the line with me as well. Uh, we are here to talk about FCRI compliance in 2017. We want to be able to give an introduction into uh, FCRI compliance and be able to answer some questions and, and really be able to better arm and uh, supply um, everyone on the call with uh, the information to best guide their hiring practices. I want to remind everyone as we go ahead and get started, um, as Amanda mentioned, please don't hesitate to ask any questions using the chat feature. We want to make sure that Joe and I have a few minutes at the end to go over and, and get back to some uh, specific questions. Uh, please join in on the conversation. Uh, you can find Sterling on Twitter, on LinkedIn. Uh, we are oftentimes sharing information in the industry, uh, whether it be staffing specific or really just background screening overall. Feel free to contact Joe and I, and, and Amanda will be distributing our contact information uh, shortly after the call. And don't hesitate to download our resources. Um, as mentioned, we have webinar, uh, webinars that we host ourselves, white papers, one-pagers, things that can definitely explain a bit more about the industry, um, background screening as a whole, and to learn today, SCRA compliance. Following the uh, the introduction that Amanda gave us um, or gave for us, 
just to, to recap, we are the, the world's largest global employment screening firm. We are um, about 20 offices wide in about nine different countries and growing. With about 3,700 plus employees, we're trusted by 50,000 percent uh, 50, clients, including about 25 percent of the Fortune 100. Uh, across that client base, we perform about 12 million candidates uh, background screens annually, with about 80 million different components across those 12 million candidates. And to, again, to follow a minute's introduction, I am Mike Thompson, I'm the Director of Sales here out of our New York headquartered office. I've uh, been with the company for a few years now, and uh, my specific focus is in the staffing industry. Um, I have not only been attending shows and, and events um, with the ASA, but also with staffing industry analysts. Uh, I take great pride in learning about your industry and the trials and tribulations that staffing companies experience in, in their daily operations. Um, my goal in connecting and, and communicating with Tricom is to attempt to bring some education, some knowledge about the staffing industry um, and how it interacts with uh, what we do here in background screening, drug testing, onboarding, uh, I-9, E-Verify, um, et cetera. And Joel, I'll give you a chance to introduce yourself. All right. Thank you, Michael. So uh, as Michael said, this is Joe Rotundo, the VP of Compliance here at Sterling. As you heard, I've been here. Oh, you don't need your calculator. I'll figure it out for you. 38 plus years. So, uh, but now my photo's up there, so you see how old I am. <laughs> when I do these webinars, typically we don't show the photo. <laughs> but uh, I filled a lot of roles here at Sterling, and uh, oh, maybe about 10 years ago, it was determined compliance is becoming a really important uh, component of background checking. So I took on this role, and um, I do webinars for our clients, and I'm here to help and. To answer questions, as has been told to you already, if there's any questions about, about any particular slide, we certainly could stop and address them, and then we'll take questions at the end also. Great. So, what are we going to cover today? Well, general information about the Fair Credit Reporting Act and some of the laws that govern background checking, the procedures that are required by the Fair Credit Reporting Act for you, uh, denying employment, which is always a topic of importance, and making sure that you have compliant methods when it comes to denying an individual employment based on a background check, and some of the legislation that we feel is important for you to know. So we're going to start with some general information just to give you an idea about the Fair Credit Reporting Act, and simply put, the law was passed in part do the complaints from consumers that their credit reports were incorrect, and as a result, the word credit's in the title. So many times I get asked, well, what if I'm not doing credit checks? Do I still have to follow the Fair Credit Reporting Act? And the answer is absolutely yes. The services that Sterling provides, um, including criminal history searches, motor vehicle searches, employment verifications, education verifications, et cetera, all fall under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Uh, CRA, that stands for Consumer Reporting Agency. Sterling is a consumer reporting agency, not to be confused with the credit bureaus or the credit report agencies such as TransUnion, who supplies actually our credit reports. And then who enforces the FCRA? Well, it's now the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, the CFPB having replaced the uh, FTC in that role. All right, so let's address the procedures that are required of you by the Fair Credit Reporting Act. So there are actually only four procedures that you must follow to be compliant with the FCRA. The end user certification, disclosure and authorization, and then the two-step adverse action process. Let's look at the first procedure, which is the end user certification of use. So this is a certification of compliance by the user, which would be your organization, that you will be, abide by the Fair Credit Reporting Act. This is a document that's signed at the beginning of the relationship. And specifically, it is your responsibility to ensure that every individual that you will be running a background check signs a disclosure and authorization form prior to submitting the order to Sterling 
and that you conduct the adverse action process, which we'll talk about in a few minutes, when denying employment based on information contained in the background check that Sterling provided. Okay, so now let's look at the disclosure and authorization form. So as we said, everyone has to sign this form before the background check gets started. And Sterling, with the assistance of outside counsel, can provide sample standalone disclosure and authorization forms. Our sample form provides for continuing consent, so there is no expiration date for the use of the disclosure and authorization form if it contains the proper language that we do have in our form. However, there is one exception, that is California. California does not permit continuing consent. New forms must be obtained for every background check in California. Okay, so the 49 states, if you hire someone, they sign a disclosure and authorization form, and then six months later, or you wanna do yearly background checks, you do not need to get another one However, in California, each time you would do a background check on that individual, you would need to get a new consent, okay? With this uh, disclosure and authorization, you should provide the federal summary of consumer rights. And there are a few states that actually have their own summary of rights that we feel should also be distributed with the disclosure and authorization. So I'll take a breath there before we go to the next uh, process procedure, which is adverse action. Is there any, any questions about the end user certification? Any questions about disclosure and authorization? And disclosure and authorization is quite important because there is litigation out there when you don't have proper forms or you don't get individuals to sign the forms or you, as we said earlier, these are standalone forms. The disclosure cannot be put on an application, it has to be a standalone form, and there is litigation out there if you don't follow these procedures under the Fair Credit Reporting Act. Okay, so let's go over the next process or procedure, which is the adverse action process. And what happens is if uh, you, ask, you would ask yourself, is there any disqualifying information in the background report? And actually, if there is not, if the background report is clear, you actually have no other obligations under the FCRA, except in a few states that actually require you to send a copy of the report to the individual, that being California, Massachusetts, Minnesota, New Jersey, and Oklahoma. So individuals in those states actually have a right to get a copy of their report if they check the box that's on the form. Um, but if not, you have no other responsibilities. However, if the report does reveal disqualifying information, there are two more steps that are required. So if you disqualify an applicant, for example, on the basis of information provided in our background check, you must follow this two-step procedure that I'm going to review now. Now, just before I go into it, Sterling does have the ability to handle this process for our clients. So it is something that we're able to do, uh, but if you're doing it on your own, let's just quickly review the pre-adverse action process. Um, I guess, let's go to the next slide, I guess. Oh no, actually, you know what? Let's just let's talk it out here. The first step is in the pre-adverse action letter. I'm sorry, Michael. Uh, so the letter is sent with a copy of the report and a copy of the Federal Summary of Rights. And as I mentioned, any states that have state summary of rights. And just one second as my computer just logged me off. Okay, and it would be, again, a copy of the report. So that's not just the disqualifying information. So for example, if somebody has a criminal record and that's the reason you're going to deny employment, you wouldn't send them just that piece of the report, you would send them the entire report, okay? And this letter actually, typically the recommendation is to send it by regular mail, but if you do wish to email or fax the letter to the candidate, please make sure that it's sent in a secure manner. 
whether it be password protected or consulting with your IT folks to make sure that it's sent in a secure fashion. The last thing you want to do is send a background check report to the wrong individual because you mistyped uh, something, uh, their email address, et cetera. Okay, so a little bit more about the process. Typically, individuals don't contest the accuracy of the report because obviously the information is correct and that person goes away. Um, and then five days later, you would send the adverse action letter, which is again, just the letter that we could provide you sample letters for these two things, uh, which basically tells the individual that they're not being employed because of uh, the example being used as a criminal record. Okay. Now, if the individual does contact Sterling within five days, we recommend that you hold the job open for at least another five to 10 days to allow Sterling to complete a reinvestigation. So that is a burden that is on Sterling. So if you were to run a background check, somebody uh, has a criminal record and they contact you, they contact us to say the record's wrong and the case has been dismissed or expunged, you don't need to do anything. We take over and we would conduct the reinvestigation. We would send somebody to the court to reinvestigate, to pull a file, to see if we can get to the bottom of uh, what this person is disputing. Okay. And there are times, however, that an individual does successfully dispute information in a background report. Uh, an example I kind of said already is the fact that somebody has a criminal record we report that we found from the court, um, but they hired a lawyer, got the case dismissed or expunged, and the court doesn't update their record. So we reported the original record, yet the person actually at this point does not have the record because it's been expunged. Well, we would then reinvestigate and find out what they've said is accurate, that the case is expunged, and we would then send you a copy of a revised report showing that the person does not have that criminal record, and obviously the individual would get a copy showing that their record is clear. Okay, so that's a little bit about the adverse action process. And again, as I said, Sterling can take over this process for you um, if you would like, or basically you just would follow the, uh, the steps that I have just uh, reviewed. All right, what else do we have, Michael? One point that I always sure. like to add in the, in the adverse action process that's really important to remember as an employer is this process is important for pre-employment as you're bringing on new candidates, but it's also important if you're rescreening a candidate for a promotion, um, if it's an internal move um, or continuing employment based on a continuous screen that you run on your current candidate pool. Um, again, any time a decision is made based on rescinding an offer, uh, terminating employment, uh, denying promotion, uh, the adverse action process is uh, something that needs to be performed. Very good, Michael. All right, so a topic that's obviously very important, and we've just covered some of it, touching base with the adverse action process, is uh, can you use some of our information, our reports, to deny employment? And one, a little bit of a controversial issue, are credit reports. So can you use a credit report to deny somebody a job? I mean, the short answer is yes, but we recommend best practice advice is to be very careful regarding job-related determination before denying somebody a job based strictly based on a credit report. Again, best practice advice not to use medical bills in evaluating a credit report. Um, and what's gone on actually in this country, there are about 10 states, and you see them listed there, and New York City that have passed laws that restrict the running of a credit report in a, an employment matter, and then using a credit report in denying someone a job. So if you're in any of those states or New York City, please be careful. Make sure that you're following the particular law. The laws vary in these in these states and, and New York City. Frankly, in New York City, where, where Michael and I are sitting today, it's virtually impossible to run a credit check um, outside of uh, maybe FINRA-related for uh, the financial 
industry and maybe some other industry uh, exception. So if you're in any other basic industry, you pretty much cannot run a credit check anymore in New York City. And we expect possibly other cities or states to pass these laws. So uh, it's important to, uh, to really understand what you can and cannot do based uh, on running credit checks. Okay. Any questions about credit reports? Okay, so let's take a look at some other legislation that you need to consider. And the first uh, first law is again this is a happens to be a New York State law. It's uh, been termed New York Article 23A, and in a nutshell. It means that if you're a New York employer, you are required to engage in an individual fact-specific analysis before you take adverse action based on an applicant or employee's criminal record. Okay, so this is a law. If we report back a criminal record and you are thinking of denying employment, you must do a specific analysis before you can deny them a job. So in the middle of the screen, you see six bullet points, and this is what is considered doing the analysis. You need to look at the responsibilities and duties that the person is looking uh, towards in terms of the job, um, how much time has elapsed since the person committed the crime, how old was the person when they committed the crime, have they been rehabilitated? And are you looking to protect the interest of your employees and the public? So this is something that you must do if you are a New York State employer, okay? Then we have, um, and that passed, I think it was 2012, and then the EEOC, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, they issued general guidance. The difference being in New York, it's a law. The EEOC, this is guidance. And in these four bullet points, this kind of sums it up, that the EEOC wants organizations to eliminate policies or practices that exclude people from employment strictly based on that person having a criminal record. An employer should not consider arrest records that did not lead to conviction. So in other words, that's a situation somebody is arrested and the case gets dismissed or they're found not guilty. That's an arrest that did not lead to conviction. So this is something Sterling has been preaching for so many years and now the EEOC also feels that way. Uh, the third bullet point, employers should not have a blanket denial policy based on a conviction record. For example, we do not hire anyone with a felony record. Now, that doesn't mean you have to hire people with felony records, but you cannot have a blanket policy that would deny somebody a job because they have a felony record. And then the last bullet point reiterates the New York law in the sense that the employer should conduct an individual analysis, and they added and dialogue, meaning they want companies to actually speak to individuals in using the criminal record in making an employment decision. So they want employers to actually talk to the individual about their record and ask them those questions in, as New York to reiterate, how old were you when you committed the crime? How many years ago was it? Or again, these are questions maybe you don't ask directly. Has the person been rehabilitated by looking at their background, uh, et cetera? Okay, so that's the EEOC guidance. Very, very important. They they do go after companies if they have a complaint from an applicant, so this is really important that you follow uh, these instructions. So something else that, you know, when I'm asked about trends and background checks, probably the biggest trend are the ban the box laws. Not sure if everyone has heard of these laws, but the ban the box laws make it illegal for employers to request on an initial written job application any information about the person's criminal history. So the old question, have you ever committed a crime or have you ever, excuse me, have you ever been convicted of a crime, uh, 
would not be legal in there are over 15 states and over 100 cities that have adopted this type of policy in either private sector applicants or public sector applicants. So this is something that continues to grow. Uh, the most recent uh, law that was passed is in the city of Los Angeles, <clears throat> excuse me, the Fair Chance Act Initiative uh, in New York City, which I highlight here, and this is from 2015, they passed a law called the Fair Chance Act. And in this case, besides taking away the question on the application, it prohibits New York City employers from requesting a criminal background check until after a conditional offer is made. So if you're in New York City, you must make a job offer, then present the person with uh, doing the background check and having the disclosure and authorization form signed. And LA is actually similar. So again, this is something we see, uh, we think is going to continue. There are going to be more cities and states that pass this type of law. Uh, the recommendation we've been given by our council, our outside council, is if you're in more than one city or state, you probably should strongly consider eliminating the criminal question from your application altogether. Especially if you're doing a criminal background check, and so to speak, you don't need that question. You're gonna be, you're gonna find out if the person has a criminal record. You don't need them to check the box that says, yes, they have a criminal record. And also keeping in mind, and many people actually don't tell the truth and they check off no anyway. So for our clients, you know, we don't see this as being a major issue uh, based on the fact that if you're running a thorough background check and a thorough criminal history search, you're going to find out that information and you still have to go through the adverse action process. So it's no longer, you know, 20 years ago when you basically said to a person, well, you lied on your application, I'm not hiring you. You still have to go through adverse action. So they're going to know the reason and uh, which is why, again, we feel when you're running the background check and a criminal history search, the ban the box laws aren't, it's, it's not going to be that much of a factor. You're still going to get the information. You're still going to be able to make a decision based on uh, your individual analysis. All right, so I will take a breath and ask if there's any questions about the ban the box laws. I hope everybody's familiar with them, or if not, at least now you are. And um, so again, we want to open it up to questions and see if there's anything out there that uh, I've just reviewed. Sure, I do have a couple of questions that have come in. Okay. Do you okay. see similar laws like New York Article 23A trending um, to the rest of the nation? Yeah, if I put my, the amazing Kreskin hat on, I'm hoping nobody knows who Kreskin is, but, um, the fact that, yes, you know, the EOC copied the New York law, Los Angeles is very similar. Uh, San Francisco has a tough ban the box law. So, again, if I had to predict, I, I would predict it will continue. The, these laws will continue to pass. They will continue to be tougher. There was some talk about even a federal law. Um, and frankly, again, to me, if there was one law, it would make things a lot easier for all of us, you know, since we're going to have to follow uh, the ban the box in all these different cities and states. If they just made one law, well, like I said, it would make life easier for all of us. And since you are running background checks and criminal history searches, it is not that big of an issue. Even the fact in, in New York and LA where you have to make a job offer before you do the background check, that's again a recommendation we've been making for so many years. You should not be collecting uh, disclosure and authorization forms which have date of birth on them before you make a job offer. You don't want to know the date of birth before the job offer is made. So again, even these parts of the law it's something Sterling has been recommending for a long time. And just one more step thing, you know, nobody's asked this question, I don't think, but why, why are these laws being passed? What, how come? And the best way I can answer it is, you know, the law is called the Fair Chance Act. Um, it, it's to give people a chance who have criminal records. And the feeling is when that question is on an application, somebody checks the box, yes. 
they don't even get to see anyone, they don't get an interview, they're automatically eliminated. And I think all of us would agree that's really not all that fair. Uh, people can have criminal records of a minor nature, and if they don't get a chance to see someone and explain it, it's just simply not being fair to the individual. So the theory behind it, I, I, I would say I agree with that people should all have a fair chance to uh, to be employed. and. Uh, by eliminating the question, um, I guess that's what a lot of the legislators and governors and mayors, et cetera, are hoping for. Okay, and right, another question. If my company is based in New York, but my applicant lives in Chicago, do I still have to follow the New York Article 23A? Yeah, I would answer that as yes, because the law is for New York City employers. Uh, there is been no litigation on this topic. It's a really good question because of the fact that, so is it where the person lives or where they're going to work or where the company's located? And our approach to this topic is a conservative one. So if the company's located in New York, the person lives outside New York, we would still say they should follow Article 23A. Um, or vice versa, the company is in New Jersey, but the person's going to be employed in the city of New York for that company. We would recommend the same thing, giving them Article 23A when they fill out their disclosure and authorization forms, and if there is adverse action following Article 23A. Um, because there has been no litigation, the last thing we want is any Sterling client to be the first one sued under it, so we take a very conservative approach. But the law says New York City employers. So I guess you could make an argument that uh, if the company if the company is located in New Jersey and the applicant lives in New York and is going to work in uh, or not going to work in New York but work in New Jersey, that you wouldn't have to do it. But uh, like I said, we take a conservative approach and we recommend it, uh, to do it and to follow the law. Okay. Um, EEOC general guidance slide. This is a question related to that. Some okay. clients are very um, persistent perspective in what they want or what they will or will not accept. So for example, they'll agree to someone who has had a misdemeanor, but not if it was a crime committed in the past three years. Does this mean that this is illegal to do if you're following your customer's guidance or requirements? Well, again, according to EEOC, which is get not a law, so illegal, I wouldn't use the word illegal, but that would uh, not be what the EEOC wants you to follow, wants the client to follow, because you're, you're automatically eliminating people with that record within the three years. So there, according to EEOC, there shouldn't be a policy of that nature. You know, we defer, again, I'm not an attorney uh, to corporate counsel with this kind of situation, but my opinion would be that they should not have that type of policy. Now, that doesn't mean they have to hire the person, but they shouldn't have a policy that, see, that's automatically eliminating somebody. And that's what the EEOC, New York, that's what they're looking to stop people, to stop people getting eliminated without having a chance. The example okay. I had used was having a felony record and having a policy that says we don't hire felons. Well, you don't have to hire felons, but you can't have a policy that says we don't hire felons. Okay, so similar to this, you know, you can't have a policy that says we don't hire anybody within the last three years who has a conviction, or if that was exactly what, uh, what that policy was. Okay, and um, your statement here may have answered this question. Um, it's along the same guidelines, but I'll, I'll go ahead and read it anyway to make sure it's been covered. Um, can a blanket statement be made regarding refusal of employment based on a specific offense, such as sex offenders or violent crime? Now, again, according to EEOC, they do not want to see that. But, you know, just talking it out loud here, it's, it's, you don't, they don't have to hire people with those records, but they want an indiv individual analysis to be conducted. The person has to get the pre-adverse action letter with a copy of their report. There should be a dialogue with the individual. 
And then the decision can be made not to employ, and the person has a right to contest that record if, it's, if they feel it's not accurate, but, and then the person can be denied. So it's really, really just following, you know, the guidance and keeping out of the, uh, the way of the EEOC, because as I said they, they do go after companies. There was one litigation against Pepsi. Uh, Pepsi paid $3.1 million in a settlement because they were not hiring individuals with arrest records that didn't lead to conviction. Uh, I believe it was they were open cases. In other words, somebody was arrested on February 2nd, 2017. Their next court date was May 5th, 2017. So that's still an open case. And in some states, that's illegal to deny somebody a job based on an open record. And I believe that's what they were doing, and they settled that case for uh, $3.1 million. So um, it is serious, and, you, you know, you just you must do things properly to stay out of the way of uh, EEOC. All right, what else do we have? I have another question that's come in. If the initial application process includes everything, including tax forms, I-9s, and background release, before a job offer is made, is this an accept acceptable application process? Well, our recommendation is that this, you know, the other forms you mentioned, uh, I have to say I've heard of them, but I'm just gonna talk about disclosure and authorization or consent form. See, we, we don't even use the word release form anymore because there has been litigation regards to release. You know, so we don't wanna release, we just want consent. Uh, that those forms should be separate from the employment application. So the disclosure, we, we're disclosing what's going to be done. The authorization, which is basically the page that the person signs authorizing the background check, should be separate from an employment application. That, again, is part of the Fair Credit Reporting Act. And there has been litigation against companies who stick those disclosure authorizations on an application you know, in the at the end of the application, no, nope, it should be on a separate page. They should be on separate pages, and uh, not be part of the application. Okay. And are you able to provide that document before the job offer is made, or does that have to come after the offer is um, of employment has okay. been provided? Sure. Well, as as I said earlier, uh, disclosure and the authorization page. And data collection page has information, name, address, social security number, and date of birth. So again, I'm not an attorney, I'm not an HR expert, but collecting date of birth before making a job offer can be considered problematic. Um, company could be charged with age discrimination. So our recommendation, which we've recommended this for many, many, many years, is to always make a job offer and then present disclosure and authorization and then collect date of birth. Date of birth is necessary for us to do the criminal history searches. <clears throat> Excuse me, so it is a piece of information we do need, but it should be collected after the job offer. Okay. I know for some that doesn't work well, but I'm just telling you again to, to protect our clients, that would be our recommendation. And I know there are companies out there that don't quite do it that way, but uh, now some of these ban the box laws are actually specifically telling companies like in New York and LA that they have to make the offer first. Okay. Another question, how, if at all, are the rules different for those independent contractor roles, 1099s versus temporary staffing employees? Yeah, we look at all employee, all all folks in these in these situations as employees or even volunteers, for that matter. We do a lot of work for volunteer organizations, people volunteering, not being paid in their volunteer work. And under the FCRA, we we kind of look at every everybody the same. So they all, we follow the same procedures and laws that we review today, whether it's a contractor, whether it's a staffing employee or whether it's a volunteer. Okay. I hope that answers that question. Yes, I believe it does. Um, can you explain a little bit about why there are two adverse action letters? 
Sure. This process was put in place basically to give individuals the opportunity to dispute the information in their background check. So if there was just one letter that basically told, would be telling somebody that they're not getting a job because of a criminal record, there wouldn't be an opportunity to dispute. So when they get that adverse letter, the pre-adverse letter with a copy of the report, that's giving them the chance to contact Sterling and their prospective employer to say, time out, I think there's a mistake, this is wrong, um, this is not me, blah, 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 whatever their you know, situation is that they're disputing, <clears throat> excuse me, and we have a team in our Independence Ohio office that handles this type of situation. So we provide an 800 number, that individual, this is in the pre-adverse letter, and they would contact our folks out there, and they would explain, oh, this record's not mine, or this record's mine, but it's not a felony, it's a misdemeanor, or whatever they want to dispute, and then we'll send a researcher back to the court uh, to pull a file to confirm what the person's saying or to verify that we what we originally reported was accurate. So that's why there are two letters giving the individual the chance to dispute the information. So if you offered them employment and you sent that adverse action letter and they were able to dispute why you were not um, going to continue with the offer, would you then have to give them that position if they were able to prove their case, essentially? Yeah, that, yeah that, that's, again, another good issue to bring up. The fact that uh, once the person contests or disputes, they would typically call the prospective employer to say, hey, I just got this report. It's, it's not right. You know, my lawyer got this case dismissed, and this says I have a conviction. So you, as the employer, should then hold that job open, and then the individual would contact Sterling, like I just said, and we would do our reinvestigation. Typically, those reinvestigations take from one to five days, really depending on the court, because when we send our researcher back, there are times when you have cooperative court clerks who will pull the file and we're able to review it right away. And there's other times those files are in on microfiche or in a warehouse and it takes a bit longer. So, but during that time, the recommendation is to hold the job open because if that dispute is in the favor of that applicant, and let's say three days later, we contact you and verify that that case actually did get dismissed. They do not have a conviction. The court now has updated their records, but when they give it, gave it to us originally, they said it was a conviction. You wanna be able to give that person the job because they don't have that criminal record. If you fill the job and they clear their background check, frankly, again, there's been litigation based on that because that person now has been denied a job even though they don't have a criminal conviction. <clears throat> Joe, I have a question for you because this is something that I, a lot of my clients in the staffing industry encounter considering these open positions are essentially their revenue, right? Every day that they don't have a person placed, they're uh, potentially losing um, that open, uh, open enrollment. Now, if they do need to have somebody in place and they decide to just, uh, decide against a specific candidate and they fill the role of another, another applicant, can they then re replace that other applicant once their background is cleared up and they, you know, they go through the adverse action process, show that it wasn't in fact them, they can now use that same record, that same report, same consent form, everything, everything can be placed in another location? I mean, in terms of them getting a job somewhere else, yes. Now, again, giving that background report to another company does lead to an issue on the disclosure and authorization. It would have to say to other companies, not just the one company. Right. Um, but that would be a perfect example of what a company should do if they needed to place somebody into a job. Again, we don't want anyone to lose revenue. We don't want people to lose, you know, salary. Uh, but then the person clears the background check. You know, if they can get them a job somewhere else, well, fine. It won't be any issue. It's when there is no other job. You know, this doesn't often happen for staffing, but it happens for other type of companies where, well, we only had one job for a bookkeeper. I don't have two jobs, so we filled the job. Well, 
that person goes and hires a lawyer, and that's a problem because they don't have a record and they didn't get the job because the company did fill the position. Okay? That's helpful. Right. Thank you for Do asking you that questions? question, Michael. That was actually one that just came in, um, so perfect timing. Another question that has come in is, with the states and um, different states and different cities having legislation that needs to be um, abided by, how do you keep informed of those changes? All righty. Well, so a couple of different ways. Number one are um, the attorneys, the outside counsel that we utilize certainly have their ear to the ground with, with legislation having to do with background checks. Uh, number two, our staff, we have... Uh, a staff of over a dozen individuals at Sterling and the legal and compliance team. So we are obviously are attuned to what's going on with the, with the different laws. And as was mentioned earlier with the National Association of Professional Background Screeners, we're uh, very much engaged with our national organization as they are with um, lobbying obviously against a lot of these laws. So certainly when something comes down the pike and something does become law, uh, we're the first to find out from our national organization. So those are the methods that, that we utilize to make sure our clients are kept up to date. The information is put on our website as soon as we find out uh, what's going on. And uh, your client service rep or account manager also would reach out and uh, inform you that there is something that, uh, as I said, coming down the pike in terms of a law regarding background checks. And I, I also skipped the slide here as we were getting ready to answer questions. Um, I put a few of the covers of our one-pagers um, and some of our white papers that we do. If you go to SterlingCountSolutions.com, you can find in our resources tab. We have not only links to upcoming webinars that we host, and, and again, we uh, have the same uh, impression that Tricom does in, in these insider uh, webinars. We try to give our clients the same type of insight into happening in the industry. We also have white papers that can be downloaded. Um, and some one-pagers that can be shared uh, within your organization uh, and within your industry. So feel free to go ahead and check out the website or reach out to uh, myself for more specific information, and we can work to get that created for you to uh, help stay better educated. Wonderful. I have one other question that's come in, and uh, this is the last one I have unless anyone has any other questions, so please go ahead and enter them now if you do. Um, it, what is a salary restriction law in Massachusetts? Oh, that's something that uh, actually this law uh, doesn't take effect till July of 2018, but just to be prepared, because this is another law that we're going to find other cities and states, <clears throat> excuse me, copying. So in Massachusetts, if you're a job applicant, you will no longer have to answer questions about your previous salary. So if you're an employer, you no longer can ask that question on the original job application. And also, companies have laws regarding or have uh, rules regarding uh, not discussing salary. Uh, that also will be illegal. So employee, coworkers can talk to each other about their salaries and have no fear of retribution by their employer. So again, eliminating the salary question on applications is uh, will be the next hot topic, I would predict, uh, this year and next year. Oh, very interesting. So again, that, Good to know. That, that's just Massachusetts at this point. But I think New York City has uh, a pending uh, law regarding this. But <clears throat> we try not to talk too much about pending legislation because many times these laws never get signed and never pass. Uh, but knowing... Uh, the wonderful mayor here in New York, uh, I would suspect he will sign that if it hits his desk. So again, we will make sure everyone knows about that uh, well ahead of time. Okay, I've also gone ahead and opened up a poll, so if you'd be so kind as to give us your feedback um, on today's webinar. I've also placed our contact information up on the screen. Uh, please feel free to reach out directly to either Mike or Joe. Uh, or myself if you have any further questions. I know a few people have asked for copies of the PowerPoint presentation. I will be able to make that available to you uh, after the session today. If anyone else is interested, please just let me know. Um, and then we'll go ahead and wrap things up. 
Um, again, thank you very much for your participation and, and Mike and Joe for sharing your knowledge about FCRA compliance. We will have a recording of this presentation available on our website at tricom.com under the resources tab in the Industry Insider Webinars section. Thank you again for your participation and watch for information on our next webinar session. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.